Welcome back to Mini Mayhem on the Roundtable. I'm Ostrich Vox, and every cartoon has that one absurd crackpot theory that ends up being real. One big plot twist that takes the audience by storm, blindsiding the narrative in ways never expected. Actually, spoiler warning for any possible cartoon twist that can't be ruined. You know, just seeing it as a statement about any concrete evidence, and you're either supporting it from the jump, or you do a double take and dismiss it as nothing more than a preposterous accusation. The writers would never, ever go that route. Star vs. the Forces of Evil is going to be no exception to this trend of insane plot twists in modern day animation. It's practically a staple of serialized western cartoons. Yet, the series thus far hasn't had the sort of twist that shakes up every single little thing and recontextualizes the entire story. The closest thing we had was Miss Hanus being the daughter of Eclipsa, something we actually predicted a year prior to the revelation. But that didn't really shake up the dynamic of our main cast all too much. Although it did serve for an interesting story arc that's sure to segue into an even more intense season 4. I think this all brings up a fair question. What would be a huge plot twist for Star then? Something that directly impacts the story on the level of a secret twin brother of a main character. Or a main character's mother actually being an evil dictator who staged her own death. How can Star leave us jaw dropped and have us go, truly everything is different now? Well, by confirming that our sweet cinnamon roll child, Marco Diaz, is actually Mumin. Or at least has Mumin in his blood. The notion of Marco having a greater purpose, having Mumin heritage, is nothing new, but certainly has more to back it up with the release of Star's Book of Spells. Information that has ties to various easter eggs in the series that propose lingering questions. Some that weren't answered, yet opens a whole new can of worms. From what we've learned here combined with the show's narrative, there's a pretty fair argument to be made with Marco's lineage, and how the show planted the seeds of it being unraveled with Marco Jr. First things first, the question that shuts down this theory almost every single time. How and why would a human ever come to Earth, let alone leave a family behind? Yeah, there's dimensional scissors, but as we discovered in Running With Scissors, Hekapu is in charge of who gets dimensional scissors. They have to be earned in order to possess them. Unless you're a pony head and still a pair from Hekapu when she's not looking. Still, that greatly limits the number of candidates to cross over into another dimension, especially Earth of all places. It would have to be someone notable, someone with a level of importance that Hekapu was involved with in the past. We don't know anyone who fits the bill in the series thus far, right? Wrong. There actually is a a character who has dimensional scissors, worked very closely with Pekapu, and has possibly appeared on Earth at some point in the past. Someone who's contacted Marco before. Someone who's directly tied to the true butterfly family. His name is Alphonse the Worthy, but you may recognize him as the funny Sailor Man painting in the DS household. Granted, the painting was in Star's room, which is debatably from Muni, but it's a part of the DS household, and that plays a very important role. Alright, so what's the scoop on Alphonse? How is he definitive proof of Marco? Marco being a butterfly. Well, in Star's Book of Spells, we don't get to learn a whole lot about him, but we do gather what makes him a pretty big deal. Or at least, he should be, as he's tied to a major character and will be the catalyst to blowing the lid off everything. Our tale begins in the Mumin Monster War, during the reign of Solaria the Monster Carver, who receives a letter from Alphonse during his time as Secretary of the Monster Peace Council, Queen Solaria. All efforts to peaceably parley with the monsters have failed, and now they will no longer allow a safe passage back through the forest of certain death. As of this writing, the monsters were unwilling to meet our demands, and therefore, we were unable to entertain theirs. It is with a sad and hardened heart that I must inform you that war with the monsters looks inevitable. Do with this information what you will, but just know that your subjects are loyal men and women such as myself, who are willing to die for their queen. We will try to return to our queen's side, but the journey is long and dangerous, since we cannot venture safely back the way we came. I do fear that this message may never reach your eyes, so I have sent three of my fastest scouts, in hopes that one of them will find a way to breach the monster's ranks and reach Butterfly Castle. In internal orderliness, Alphonse the Worthy, Secretary of the Monster Peace Council. Suffice to say, Alphonse had a sour experience with the monsters, which didn't help ease tensions nor persuade Solaria's mind towards peace. In fact, Alphonse and Hekapu not only became two of Solaria's most interested counselors, but Alphonse sharing his horrific experience on the peace mission he previously wrote about was what convinced the rest of the council to vote on war. Realistically, Solaria had her mind made up, but there's no denying, Alphonse is who convinced the rest of the council, the rest of Muni, that war against the monsters is the only viable solution. He is just as responsible as Solaria for all the mayhem and carnage that followed. 
I guess it's fitting that they would end up together and have a child. Solaria's successor, Eclipse of Butterfly. Yes, Alphonse the Worthy, the man in the DS household painting, is the father of Eclipsa. Not only is the most twisted, maniacal, genocidal butterfly against monsters is the one who gave birth to the queen most sympathetic towards monsters, but the father is the one who sparked the war that changed everything. Oddly enough, neither Alphonse nor his fate is mentioned by Eclipsa in her chapter. In fact, the last big mention in the Book of Spells remains in Solaria's chapter. She touches on sending her brother Justin, former boy queen of Muni, Alphonse, and Hecapu on a diplomatic mission to recruit assistance from the Ponyhead family and the Lucidors during an assault from the Monster Horde, sneaking out the castle with none other than Alphonse's dimensional scissors. Funny that they chose to include that key detail, huh? Making it clear that he especially has access to other dimensions. Solaria even chooses to mention the mission was a success, but specifically stating Hecapu's mission was a success, excluding Justin and Alphonse from the equation. Shortly after this entry, Solaria passes off the book to Eclipsa, who again, never mentions Alphonse. Solaria was killed early into Eclipse's entry, but alas, she still fails to mention the location and fate of her father. So what happened to him? Well, straight to the point, I believe he fled. Either during the peace mission or around Solaria's demise, Alphonse and company figured his life was in danger as well and sought refuge off of Muni. Although he likely had to return to Muni at some point, on the account of his portrait in Star's room depicting him of old age. Assuming that portrait was in Star's room prior Prior to moving to Earth. If not, and Star's room on Earth was a spur of the moment fabrication, and the wand chose to create a room that best suited the dimension, that especially adds more fuel to the fire. That a portrait of Alphonse was accounted for by the wand. Regardless, the dimension he retreated to was none other than Earth. Now, I know what you think I'm about to say. Alphonse, and by extension Eclipsa, is a blood relative of Marco due to his time on Earth. Uh, no actually. I believe Alphonse came to this dimension because Mumins already resided there. You see, in the very first chapter in the Book of Spells, Skywind's chapter, the Queen recounts an event where she, uh, erased gravity. It was a whole thing, but this resulted in a handful of Mumins being lost to space. Now, this page also has some encrypted messages written in low Mumian. Two that read, 16 humans were lost to space. They ended up inhabiting another planet, which is now a bustling world. I think it's safe to say this planet mentioned is Earth. Now, Skywind was the mother of Solaria, so it's safe to say that event wasn't forgotten. And in fact, they set out to locate those Mumins, but instead of retrieving them to come home, they let them thrive in this new location. The fact remains though, Alphonse was aware Mumins were on Earth and acted accordingly, hiding out until Muni once again gained the upper hand against the monsters. Knowledge of Earth serving as a ground zero for a new generation of Mumins could explain why River and Moon decided to send Star there, why Mina Loveberry ended up here in Starstruck. To River and Moon, they know it as a mundane dimension where not much happens. A few Mumins came here hundreds of years ago, which really just put it on the map. That's the only reason why they're aware of it. For Mina Loveberry, it was a significant location where the man who loved her master resided for a bit. And if you guys are unaware of Mina Loveberry's origins, we covered that as well. Check it out. Now, yes, I do believe these Mumins who ended up on Earth are linked to Marco. One of these Mumins, or their descendants, mated with humans, who, after hundreds of years, brings us to the current DS family. And Marco. Not only would this mean Marco is half human, half mutant, Human, but the look of their house for the first two seasons. Being a suburban household with aspects of a giant castle sticking out was elaborate foreshadowing on their end. Okay, now rewinding a bit, how does Alphonse prove Marco is Mumin? Remember Blood Moon Ball? And how the painting of Alphonse seemingly spoke to Marco, tempting him to go intervene with the Blood Moon? Blood Moon tonight. The Moon of Lovers. I think the spirit of Alphonse was dabbling in some form of shipping. Perhaps Marco's human ancestors did Alphonse a solid and let him lay low on Earth all those years ago, which gave him a great respect for the DS family. So when his ghost, who may be binded to the painting, caught wind of Tom inviting Star to the Blood Moon Ball, he knew Tom was planning on their souls being intertwined and felt that if Star was destined to be with anyone, it had to be a Diaz. So taking a gamble and interfering with the mortal realm, he spoke to Marco, planting the seeds for the two souls to be binded to each other. 
each other. Side note, you know how the Diaz's seem to be filthy sick and rich? Or at least, they're comfortable. That could also help Marco be seen as someone who stems from a royal family. For all we know, the past Moomin Diaz's were royalty. Maybe they're not just loaded because of Raphael and Angie's occupations, but because they inherited that wealth from either Raphael or Angie's bloodline. Actually, the more I think about it, we don't know Angie's last name. Not that it's Butterfly, but it's more likely the descendant of a Mewman, even after race mixing, would look more like Angie than Raphael. Just food for thought. I know I've been saying Diaz ancestor, but really, I mean an ancestor of either Marco's father or Marco's mother. Another major detail that factored into speculation of Marco being a Mewman comes from him using Star's wand, how it transformed to a wand that looked way too specific in detail to not have greater meaning. It even looked kind of sinister. I mean, a sweet cinnamon roll like Marco shouldn't result in a wand like this. Well, what if the look of the wand is actually the crest of Marco's ancestors' clan, from their earlier days as Mumins who were setting up shop on Earth. Just an idea. And yes, now let's touch on those cheek marks. Cheek marks in the lore of Star is a result from exposure to magic, which is how Marco got his from using Star's wand. But that doesn't explain why the light of the Blood Moon revealed Marco's cheek marks once again in the episode Booth Buddies. When Star grabbed the photos from the booth, it comes across as if they were there the entire time. They just have to be properly awakened and only surface in specific Specific scenarios. We know cheek marks can also be a natural feature mumins have at infancy, such as Meteora. For half-bloods, it could skip a few generations, or again, need to be properly unlocked like Marco's. Which is why I believe Marco Jr. was a character and plot point introduced to blow the lid and drop this heavy revelation. When Marco Jr. is born, I believe he could have cheek marks on his face, just like anyone in the Butterfly family. Marco and Star could ponder if this is a result from Star's magic shenanigans, or any past adventures, which will lead to the grand revelation that yes, Marco, you're a Mewman. Now go marry Star. Okay, I know this feels like a shot in the dark, but so was Heinous and Eclipse being related. Just like this theory, we had little to work off of, but enough to make something kind of substantial. I guess we'll just have to wait and see. But as always, these are just my thoughts and I want to hear yours. Could Marco be half Mewman? What implications do you think that would have on the series? Let us know in the comments below or tweet those thoughts to me at Fox and at Roundtable Vids. We're also on Instagram. If you went up the Roundtable Girl, you could become a member of this channel, you can some badges, emojis, member only community posts, or you can support us on Patreon. Your name can be at the end of the video, depending on how much you pledge you can get a shout out, and get access to scripts, avatars, and so much more. Link in the description. If you enjoyed this video, please throw it a like, share, and if you're new here, subscribe. Hit that bell for notifications to stay in the loop with all things Star. Thank you for watching, and I hope you have an awesome day. Vox out.